There was a scientist in Japan a few years back who made an incredible discovery, but one that even today is generally unacknowledged by the global scientific community. Many of us are familiar with the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto and his experiments freezing water into crystals, which would change their form depending on what emotions were meditated upon before freezing. Now, this experiment received a lot of scrutiny and several failed attempts to reproduce it. However, there is another version of it, which is equally as moving. Emoto discovered that by putting words on the side of a jar of rice with water in it, and every day casting either love, hate, or unacknowledgement towards the jar, it would dramatically change the way that the rice fermented. This experiment has been performed around the world and is easily replicatable by anyone, even you, and I super encourage anyone who's interested to look up the experiment and give it a try. And for those who have trouble replicating the experiment, we might find more information with Dr. Radden's presentation, who says that there was a very clear difference in the results between practiced meditators and people whose minds tend to wander. Having a strong mental and emotional resonance will affect the outcome of the experiment significantly. If thoughts and feelings can do this to organic matter, just imagine what they can do to us. Uh... I'd first of all like to uh, say a bit about my own involvement with this. Um, I'm actually probably one of the first people to have heard about Jacques Benveniste's um, important work. This was a conference on the island of Bermuda where the um, organiser, David Lorimer, said, I think you'll be interested in the next lecture coming up. And that was um, Jacques talking about his uh, experiments on high dilution work. And uh, so we interacted quite a bit and... Um, I actually uh, was able to persuade people at the Cavendish Laboratory, which is the physics department of Cambridge University, to um, have him give the departmental seminar. And I also had them video recorded on old technology videotape um, uh, and um, for posterity. The current theory of molecular signaling is the following. There is a ligand, molecule A, that connects through the receptor to the molecule B. And this will trigger a function. Uh, this is supposed to work through structural matching, like two teaspoons, one against each other. And this structural matching is supposed to create uh, enough glue for the two molecules to stick together, and enough information for this information to the specific signal to pass on and then to the next one and then to the next one, all this in a very quick time. We are absolutely not, as has been printed and said, refusing the idea of molecule existing or the, mole or the ligand uh, uh, receptor interaction at all. Everything is the same. Okay, so what we are saying is that between this and this, there is a, a matching of two waveforms, which uh, probably works through a co-resonating system. Uh, so um, he had this idea that it is the sort of signal that's involved, and this led him eventually to uh, a later kind of experiments. We, we actually tried this. Um, uh, he brought along equipment at the Cavendish, and uh, the results were not quite significant. So he, uh, it was only time to do one test, and of the four samples, the one which had both been subject to, um, well, had the um, active material and be subject to succussion, uh, the process involved in homeo homeopathy, that was the only one which um, led, which, where uh, there was reasonable coagulation. So, but of course, that's only significant at 25% level. But anyway, I um, actually looked up uh, a couple of days ago, I, I realized I didn't quite know what he had done exactly. He had developed an in vitro test for sensitivity to allergens. You want to know if a person would be sensitive to an allergic material, so he developed a method whereby you could take cells from that person and see if they responded. Um, and he found, oh, there was a um, homeopathic uh, doctor or person in favour of it in his lab said, why don't you see if this, it works with highly diluted samples? And he was very sceptical, but lo and behold, it did work. Uh, and then he um, did these tests on activation uh, electromagnetically. He, um, uh, yeah, show that. Um, uh, <laughs> that in a minute. Um, uh, what he did was to pick up 
a signal from the active material and then you could transmit it over the internet or somewhere to another place and that could be used to activate water. Anyway, uh, so he submitted, uh, not sure what happened to the colour there, but anyway. Uh, so he submitted to Nature and the referee said, well, we can't find anything wrong with this. It was a collaboration with lots of people, in fact. Uh, but uh, after we publish it, uh, we'll send someone to your lab to see if it's, um, uh, to check whether it's valid. It's a very strange way of doing things. You normally check whether something is um, uh, correct before you publish it. But he wanted to show Maddox up. He was a totally um, untutored people went along. We didn't understand things about biology, like some things sometimes work for a bit and then something goes wrong. Um, so there was this rather nasty attack on him and um, he was knighted for that among other things. I think the, the Queen, had, if she'd known about this, would have said, no, we can't have, he can't be Sir John. Um, anyway, okay, uh, I want to get on to the science, but before I do that, I'm going to talk about the non-science, the uh, unscientific stuff. Here are three of the reasons people give for why homeopathy is totally uh, impossible. I don't know whether I should embarrass the person who said that no molecule is no effect. If you look it up, you'll see a well-known critic who says that. Um, well, the idea is you've diluted all the molecules, uh, so there can't be any, anything left to produce um, uh, a cure. Of course, that neglects the fact that you might be doing something to water, and that what, what it might be doing to water is what I'll be talking about later on. So that's the first dodgy argument. Second one is um, actually a former head of department said this. Uh, we know uh, things happen very quickly in water, and you want memory to um, persist for a long time. Well, that's a very spurious argument because you could clearly have more than one time scale for different things, and it's just a, a non-argument. And the third dodgy argument is, um, well, if water could remember what it had been in contact with, it would remember everything that it had been in contact with in the past, and there'd be total confusion. But you might say the same about magnet. Um, a magnet would be affected by any magnetic material it came in contact with. But of course, what happens is that some things have a strong influence, and they produce the... Um, organizing effect, and this may be resistant to everything else. So that's what would happen with homeopathy. Your, your preparation process would um, have some effect organizing the water, and um, uh, this might be persistent and not be affected by what other things the water came into contact with. But when this actually found that people seem to have an effect, one of his people, um, uh, if one of his people uh, did the experiments, they got, he got, they got a very good effect, whereas another person seemed to wreck the effect. So clearly we're dealing with something rather complicated. Okay, now um, one kind of organization would be static organization, which is what physics is m mainly concerned with. And this is actually um, a simulation by people at Princeton University. I'll, I'll, uh, show you extracts from their paper in a moment. But what they did was to uh, make a model for, um, I guess the um, red must be oxygen and the white hydrogen. Yeah. Um, they produced a model for how these things interact, in, including a tendency for um, tetrahedral bonds, because that's what the bonds are like. Uh, that's what the chemical bond of carbon is like. So we put in a uh, something which um, uh, persuaded or tended to make a tetrahedral organization. And they found you've got these large clusters like that. And uh, there's some extracts from some of the, um, uh, I guess you can look at the titles if you're interested, uh, extracts from the abstracts. In uh, the specific volume of small clusters and individual molecules that adopt highly tetrahedral arrangements with their four nearest neighbors is smaller than the bulk value. This means the formation of ice-like regions having a density lower than the bulk is cooperative. So the key word there is a cooperative phenomenon revealed by these computer simulations and involves many molecules. So you can't think of molecules in isolation, which is the naive view. 
uh, another paper, we identify a structurally anomalous region bounded by loci of maximum orientational order at low densities, translational order at high densities. Um, well, these are things that happen in crystals. Uh, the, um, you get a particular orientation of the um, unit cells and also has translational order. Um, anyway, this region um, encloses the entire range of temperatures for which the anomalous phenomena in water are observed. Of course, water, water is a strange substance, the way it, it starts expanding as you cool it down and expands further when you get ice. And we also find that these anomalies constitute a cascade. I um, haven't heard the details of the paper, but that, that's rather interesting that you have steps. It isn't a single thing. They occur consecutive, consecutively as the degree of order is increased. OK, well, that is um, a kind of static order as you can get in a substance. There are no dynamic effects. Now, something I came across fairly recently, which is pretty well unknown, uh, more music now. You, when you play music to water, it has developed a structure, as you'll see here. Structure changes as the music changes. Sonata, you probably recognize. Now it's going to start changing again. <laughs> and this is the invention of uh, John Stuart Reed. Uh, a number of these videos on, um, uh, on YouTube. Uh, that, that's actually by someone else because uh, uh, well, the videos he sent me have got lots of jazzy effects and I, I thought it better to have one which isn't like that. But anyway, um, you have a camera uh, on top which takes a picture and he found the best uh, it, there's a, an illumination, a light source, and he said it's um, arranged in a, a conical um, arrangement, a light source. Uh, and the light then goes down to a, a cell with water in it, and above it, well, you've got a single signal processor producing the sound, and I assume that's loudspeakers above it. So you just um, play the music and, and see what pattern the reflected light what the transmission light looks like. And I have a short video showing. Um, uh, Hi, so, so this thing. is. That's uh, what it actually looks like. Uh, that's seen in the camera. This is a, a video showing the cancer cell 4 being imaged on the cymoscope. Here you now see we're going to go down and look at the uh, uh, thing itself. The black magic camera. And if we come down to the cymoscope So here itself, you see the water. You see there is the water cell with the imagery actually happening in real time. So, um, right, so there's this, um, I guess you can buy one of these cymoscopes or make it yourself and um, it's uh, a really remarkable phenomenon. Uh, I don't know how much it's just non-linear physics or he seems to think that things are happening at the molecular level as well. Uh, so there's lots of uh, stuff on the internet. Uh, he also thought that it exhibited memory effect. Uh, maybe the evidence is not that strong at the moment, but here he's talking to somebody about um, memory. Um, let me see, can I pause? Um, uh, oh, well, I haven't started yet. Um, 
what he does is to apply a signal to water and see how long it takes for pattern to develop. And it's longer the first time and subsequent times. And he says that's the general rule which suggests that the water is remembering what's been done to it. This experiment, take one. Frequency generator set to 9.87 hertz. Now this frequency has not been imaged before. The microliterage is 680. I'm going to ramp the amplitude up at the same moment as starting the timer now. Well, that took six seconds to reach full amplitude. Going to ramp it up again now. That took five seconds to reach full amplitude. Going to ramp it up again now. That also took five seconds to reach full amplitude. Going to ramp it up again now. Four seconds to reach full amplitude. Um, Set the timer. Well, so uh, again. that by itself is perhaps not very convincing, but he says there is more evidence. So now uh, I want to get on to the physics behind all of this. The thing I'm interested in, as I said, I think we're maybe moving to a new uh, epoch now. Here's what I, uh, my diagnosis, that's actually the chapter of a book, with The Trouble with Physics, uh, by Peter Voigt, I think. Um, I think insisting that, you, uh, that your theory predicts numbers is restricting its range of applicability. In fact, it's not really applicable to biology because of a great variation between uh, um, different versions of the same system. Uh, now, so looks like it uh, works well with matter, but not with things like mind and meaning. Uh, another thing is that complexity is probably important. Complexity and regular maths don't go well together. New physics is needed. Uh, so we do we have anything. Um, well, this new physics requires a sort of new picture of what's going on. Uh, now, uh, various candidates, these are various... A lot of people have talked about uh, what's needed. Um, well, you could just say organized complexity, but that's obviously too vague to be scientific. But organization is the key. Uh, implicate order is David Bohm's idea. He talked about um, order being enfolded and unfolded uh, and meaning coming out of it. The uh, thing which is very important, I believe, is um, sign theory. This is, um, goes back to the 19th century. Um, incidentally, cymatics goes back to, well, apparently Faraday first discovered these patterns in water. Uh, but anyway, um, Pierce introduced the idea of semiotics. Um, and uh, we say the difference between um, this book by Hofmeier on biosemiotics, which makes the point that uh, physicists talk about information, um, whereas in biology you have signs, signs being that they are um, information directed to an end, and that's not really studied in physics, but it's important in biology. So, um, uh, in fact, that's then been, um, uh, in the latter half of the second century, a few biologists took up the application of science theory to biology, which people had uh, just assumed is relevant to um, things like human communication, but they these people said, well, no, perhaps it's, perhaps it's relevant to biology generally, which I'll be showing you. And um, uh, interesting ideas came out of this analysis. Semiotic scaffolding, semiome, which is a semiotic analogy to the genome, uh, semiosphere, code duality, all these ideas come out. Um, though they're not really treated so much by physicists, and I think physicists need to get into this and apply there special methods. Uh, oh, there's a physicist, Karen Barrard, who's written a book on uh, agental realism, and uh, he's taken the idea that various agencies work together to produce a phenomenon, 
which of course is a biological thing, and a special kind of interaction which she calls intra-actions, and makes links with uh, quantum physics, um, particularly the observation process, which is actually complicated and involves, um, uh, well, I say the collapse of a wave function involves a number of things working together. So she's made connections. I uh, actually didn't include, um, what's his name, Ruth Kastner, as um, uh, something called, um, uh, well, it's, the, um, it's an interpretation of quantum mechanics where systems communicate with each other. And I think I've been interested in the rather um, intuitive idea of Alexa Yardley, ideas like oppositional dynamics. Uh, okay, now let me talk a bit about the question of order. And an idea there is that order and disorder go together. Uh, and ordering, as I said. Um, now, uh, the first point is that order arises spontaneously. In fact, Peirce's um, semiotic idea uh, said really nature is fundamentally random, but it, it does organize itself against the background of randomness. Uh, so order arises spontaneously, uh, and the creation of order or ordering is a part of nature. Uh, but order includes disorder. These are fluctuations which are... Um, when you talk of something in equilibrium, there's also disequilibrium, as you fluctuations are part of equilibrium state. These go together, like yin, yin and yang. Um, and, uh, but uh, in physics, you don't have much in a, in a way of organized disorder um, where parts relate to each other in special ways. Um, but anyway, to have order requires ordering to be present. Otherwise, the fluctuations would grow and grow, and ordering processes um, uh, stop the order getting too great in an equilibrium situation. Um, now, uh, getting back to a point I think I made earlier, uh, crystals have order, but that is static order. In life, there's a dynamic kind of order. Uh, so we have order, ordering within activity. Uh, but we don't understand this very well. So the development in physics, the next stage in physics, I'm predicting, will involve understanding it better. Uh, right. Now, uh, I'm just going to uh, mention a couple of ideas which there have been. There's this idea of semiotic scaffolding. Well, first of all, the definition, scaffolding is whatever it is that supports a given kind of activity. So when you do something like learn to walk or talk, there's something in the background which supports that. Um, we uh, um, Humans learn to talk because there's a special kind of structure which lets people learn to talk. Um, so it's a two-way thing. There's in the next row, um, we have... Uh, uh, scaffolding uh, gives rise to activity, but activity also develops the scaffolding. Uh, a particular example of this is language, where um, you have, as you learn language, your language capacity gets better, if the scaffolding of your language activity gets better. Uh, there's also two processes. There's becoming active and there's a less active stage. Um, you have to be more active and more disordered when you, you search for new things, and then you have to settle down to stabilize that order. So that's another thing. Now, I mentioned uh, the case of language, which um, I gave a talk a few years ago at a conference in um, Imperial College where I hadn't come across many of his ideas, and I said, well, language is an amazing thing. It comes from all the, almost nothing and develops into this amazingly intricate structure. Uh, the key thing is that there are many components working together as a unit. So that's a basic thing. Why do they work as a unit? Well, the simple answer, um, working together equates to stability. So in other words, you try to reach a stable situation. Once it's stable, they tend to lock into that position. So that's a very crude explanation of why we get these complicated structures underlying 
biological activity. Uh, but it isn't just things um, naturally coming together. This scaffolding uh, pushes things in the right direction. We, uh, um, we sort out what happens in language because we, we have the skill for doing it. Uh, let me give an example of uh, uh, how we have a skill of putting things together. If you're assembling something mechanically, uh, in the first place you don't um, do it very well, but you get more skilled in placing them correctly to put things together. So this is roughly um, why uh, what's going on when we learn. For example, with language you have to um, uh, put the bits of language together in the right way and once you, know the, um, once you know the grammar, you can put the words together in such a way that it has meaning. So that's um, another aspect. Uh, uh, and so nature sorts things out eventually um, and gets better and better at it over time. Well, these are just very qualitative ideas, and, but one would expect that the science will um, figure out um, the proper basis of these things. So what kind of investigation uh, would there be? Um, well, first of all, there's kind of uh, looking at nature to see what regularities there are. That's the sort of thing I've been talking about. You develop theories, some being mathematical. I think some mathematical models will uh, justify ideas about what, what happens with um, complex systems and uh, computer models. And I had a uh, um, a uh, student, George Osborne, no relation to the ex-chancellor and uh, editor of the um, London newspaper. Uh, this is just um, uh, the, um, on the left you have the website where you can read this. This is how, how its program works. This sort of shows that you can treat this scientifically. Unfortunately, the powers that be a laboratory, amazing though it may sound, said this is not physics. You can't work on this project anymore. I was very annoyed because I had this whiz kid in uh, developing computer programs and it might have gone ahead a lot, but the um, powers that be, who of course could control what students could do, stopped it happening. Now I think um, but after a couple of decades it is moving forwards. I'd just like briefly to mention um, the circular theory, uh, just w one idea. Um, it's a very obscure a book sounds almost like nonsense. In fact, she wrote to me, everything is a circle, and eventually I learned a circle is a very subtle idea. Um, it actually makes more sense if you talk in terms of scaffolding, and she's really talking about a universal scaffolding concerned with universal principles of how to put things together and stop them together, which, of course, is important in language. You, you uh, divide speech into units, uh, you find the right kind of units and then you put them together. So that would be the fundamental scaffolding of reality. And it's, um, uh, there's also this idea, um, uh, oh, it's a hidden background. Um, we, don't, we're not, we don't see very directly what enables us to be good at language. Um, OK, so, um, and, uh, let me go back. Yeah. Um, okay. So what I'm going to say. Um, uh, yes. One idea I didn't put on the slide is this idea of oppositional dynamics. Two things which are uh, distinct and yet are well uh, placed to to go together. And this is a key thing which comes out of this um, these mechanisms. Okay. Now uh, the last but one slide. Um, uh, where, do ma where does the mind and matter fit into this? Well, scaffolding, um, a point emphasized by people in biosemiotics is that these things work by picking out what is meaningful. So meaningful information can enforce structure. So you get mind and matter. The information is the mind aspect, and the things more structural, like are built up of matter. So we'd expect mind and matter to be built up. And um, I would hope, as uh, John Archibald Wheeler did, that um, these principles will give rise eventually to all of science. Um, you have to go um, up step by step. 
uh, shows step by step how it worked from very, very something very simple to the kind of um, universe and laws of physics we have today. And of course, the biological signal will be a special case of that. Well, I'm going to finish with my own uh, cymatic um, picture. This was not. Um, this was something I, a video I took naturally, and it was not uh, the music. Um, played by my daughter's band, incidentally, as a background. But the music is not what's producing this, these intriguing patterns. Uh, 